first of all, um, I'd like to thank you, my incredible wife, um, who just gave birth three months ago to two incredible twins. Um, without her and her support, um, I wouldn't be here, so you wouldn't be able to listen to my talk. She made it possible that I can have my or do my daddy duties while I'm also doing my, this talk over here. So um, catch her up after the talk. Um, talk to her. Don't only talk about baby stuff to her because she is in the industry as well. So you can definitely ask her questions about cars and security and uh, data analysis, actually. Yeah, um, a little disclaimer up front. I have to do this because... Um, I have several votes. Right now, I don't represent anybody else than me. So I'm not res representing my home company. I'm not res representing any of the um, consortia that I'm working for. Um, this is just me. I use some material which was published um, before or not has been published yet by the USDOT or CAMP. I got permission for that, but that's all. I'm not res representing them. I'm not speaking on their behalf. Um, it's me, purely, and my views, my opinions. What is V2X? Anybody here in the room that hasn't, or let's do it the other way around. Who has heard about V2X and knows what it is? OK, there are a few that haven't heard about it. So maybe a quick introduction to that. Um, it's about vehicles and infrastructure exchanging messages in an unmanaged way. So there is a direct connection between those devices. Um, there are several standards out there to do this. There's one Wi-Fi based. Um, there's another one uh, cellular V2X uh, or cellular internet um, based. And the idea is that without any infrastructure like cell towers or roadside units, they can exchange messages um, directly. There are some applications that go over infrastructure for sure, um, like especially when, when there's a backend involved, um, but they don't have to for all the applications. So there are applications that actually require direct interaction because, for example, out of latency reasons. And I think the easiest way to kind of introduce you to this is just to go quickly through a couple of applications so they get a picture um, what's done there. The first one I wanted to show here is forward collision warning. So there's a car in front of you which suddenly hits, hits the brakes pretty hard, and it's sending at the same time a message telling you where it is, where it's heading, uh, what speed it has, and uh, that it is braking right now. And then regardless if the car is right in front of you so that other car sensors like LiDAR or radar could see this car, um, you still get this message and can, could react to that. Even if there are a couple of cars in between, um, you would still get this message and you would be able to react to that. So there are a couple of advantages to V2X communication over standard or classical um, car sensors that we have in cars nowadays. Another one is traffic light assistance. So there's a traffic light which sends out the information when the next screen shows up or when the next red comes up. And based on that, you could give a um, recommendation to the driver um, to slow down uh, because he wouldn't make the green light or to start up your um, automatic um, stop system in time for the next green phase. Another one is intelligent traffic signal. So traffic signals that are looking at the current traffic situation because there are cars sending, uh, sending messages all the time. And based on that, they could just count how many cars are there, and uh, especially at inter intersections, they could decide to change the green light or the red light accordingly in order to optimize traffic flow. And now you think, awesome, civil attack. I can get a green light, right? And you're probably right, if you're capable to do that. Another one, road condition reporting. So snow plows running around, and they're reporting back to some central traffic management system what the current road condition is. And if that's too bad, or the, the weather is pretty bad on, on the road and it's icy, based on that, the traffic management system could decide to reroute traffic um, in order to avoid traffic congestions or, in worst case, um, crashes based on, on the ice out there. And now you think, awesome, traffic rerouting. If I'm able to just manipulate those messages and tell everybody, hey, you can't go through this street here because it's totally iced, it's blocked, whatever, suddenly all the traffic goes 
through other directions. How does this work? So just two examples that I brought in terms of message content. BSM is the basic safety message. What's in there? Speed, position, heading, acceleration, timestamp, signature, and a certificate. Um, based on that, you can implement a whole bunch of uh, V2V um, safety applications, crash avoidance applications. And another one is the SPAT. Um, that's about traffic light phases, the timestamp, and the signature, and certificate. Why I'm showing this here is there are two similarities here, or two um, items here in both of those messages, and that is the signature and a certificate. So that's security. So much for a quick introduction to V2X. If you want to know more, Craig is here. You can buy his book um, in the vendor area. There is a pretty good introduction to V2X in there, um, which I think is a pretty good starting point if you want to learn more about that. If you're already a little bit more advanced and you want to implement stuff, um, just a quick highlight to a project that was just published at Black Hat by Onboard Security. It's the last point on the slide. Onboard Security published a open source DSRC validation tool which generates um, messages that are compliant to the necessary standards. You could do this with the first hardware that are listed there and GNU Radio. Um, there are also, there's also a Linux kernel that I think already is in the upstream, uh, Linux kernel patch which is already in the upstream uh, which implements the necessary radio um, capabilities for uh, HD9K based Wi-Fi cards. Um, so if you want to play around with that, that might be good starting points for you. So now let's a little bit, look a little bit into security. Um, I did a talk here at the Cogging Village two years ago. Um, if you want to deep dive into how the system is built, how it works, um, just look up this talk. Um, it's on YouTube, I think. Um, the important point I want to highlight here is pseudonym certificates. So those certificates that we saw in the messages before uh, are so-called pseudonym certificates that are used to create signatures and enable the other side, the receiving end, to verify those signatures. They're called pseudonym because cars have a whole bunch of them, so they kind of can hide their identity behind them. They ex exchange them on a frequent basis so that nobody could use the certificate in order to track a car. If it, they would always use the same one, you just need to listen to one message at a starting point and then listen to another message at the end point of the traffic and if the same certificate shows up on both sides, you know that this car was traveling from A to B. With pseudonym certs, there is some form of protection against that because they're changing those um, certificates, so you can't use the certificate for that. And the idea goes through the whole communication stack. So all identifiers are exchanged on a regular basis at the same time so that there's no identification in there. I just wanted to highlight this because this pseudonymity concept is an important concept for privacy protections in the system. And later on, if you look at misbehavior detection, what this talk is about, we kind of need to break this pseudonymity to a certain point because otherwise we're not able to identify um, bad actors. So the first line of defense for V2X security um, for sure is if you talk about signatures and certificates, the private key. If you just look at what was proposed or is proposed in upcoming or proposed regulations, um, especially in the US, there are certain standards that are required that you have to implement or certify for your devices. Over here in the US, it's FIPS 140-2. Um, in Europe, um, there is um, the idea of a Commons criteria-based certification and a protection profile for that is about to be published within the next weeks. The point that I want to make here is this first line of defense might not be enough. Because if you look at, for example, FIPS 140-2, there are no protections against um, side channel attacks required in there. And we all know that this is kind of daily business um, for you guys. So that might not be enough. That doesn't mean that, no, that OEMs or other device manufacturers that are implementing V2X right now don't add to that, that they don't add side channel protections. But if you look at this from a regulation point of view, this is not enough. So we need to go beyond that. And then 
if you're building walls, like the security causes that we oftentimes see on slides, um, don't forget that there might be miners that try to go around your walls, under your walls, over your walls. Um, so side channel and the direct hardware, um, security hardware, is not the only asset that you need to protect. In fact, if the device is generating a message which uh, and the applications built on that are uh, depending on the position, for example, within this message, the question is, how does the vehicle that sends the, uh, the message generates this position? And then you come to GPS as one of the inputs. And you don't need to necessarily get access to the private keys in order to get a message into the system which doesn't reflect reality, which doesn't reflect an actual position of a car. You just need to kind of fake the GPS position or the input to the car, and then the car itself generates the message for you, which is not reflecting reality because you just spoof the GPS position for that car. And this is actually a recent publication um, where they were able, um, where we demonstrated with a device which is, I think, around about 225 bucks in hardware and some clever software where they were able to fake or where they were able to spoof the GPS position in a way that Google Maps actually rerouted the car to a different endpoint. So what it took into consideration with their software is the actually street network. They were able to spoof to a position uh, in a way that Google Maps recalculated the route and then ended up in a different endpoint, which is C over here, instead of D where the original or where the user originally wanted to go to. If you take this and would apply this to V2X, you see how easily, or not how easily, because nobody demonstrated yet, but a potential pitfall for V2X messages as well. This whole introduction is just about highlighting the importance of misbehavior detection, um, and especially the research on that. A quick definition, what is misbehavior? When I say misbehavior, I mean the willful or inadvertent, in this case there was somebody spoofing the message, so the original device doesn't do anything willfully here, transmission of incorrect data within the car to x network. And incorrect means it doesn't reflect reality. It doesn't reflect your position, it doesn't reflect your speed, it doesn't reflect your heading. Misbehavior detection on the other side is the process of identifying this misbehavior. So actually figuring out there was somebody who sent a um, message that was not reflecting reality, so it included incorrect data. Um, a couple of selected research approaches on this, and this work is heavily based on uh, work from uh, colleagues in Europe. Um, one idea that, was, that came up in research was a verifiable path history. If there would be a way that you could figure out where a car was in the past, you could extrapolate to the current position and then figure out if this car is actually faking its position. This would be especially helpful for um, against um, cyber, attacks, cyber attacks, because if a car has a whole bunch of certificates and an attacker is able to get access to the private keys and the certificates, they could simulate a whole bunch of cars. They wouldn't need to use those certificates for just one car. For example, in the US there were talks about having 20 certificates valid per week. In Europe we are talking about 100 certificates per week, so in Europe you could, if you get access to that, so that's always a big if, but if you are able to get around the first line of defense, you would be able to simulate 100 cars at the same time. And then you get a green light, right? So verify path history, um, the idea was that there are roadside units that send you a timestamp um, time beacon, a signed timestamp actually beacon that you would then incorporate into your messages. And therefore, there is a very small chance that a couple of cars get actually the very same timestamp from a couple of those roadside units and would be able to kind of show you a string that looks exactly the same. If that happens, if you see a whole bunch of cars that have exactly the same um, verifiable path, you actually 
have a high chance of seeing a civil attack going on right now. The issue with that is we need new protocols. So an issue not necessarily in terms of this won't work, but nobody took it further than that so far. It's a, I think, pretty good idea, but we don't have a protocol yet which reflects that. We would need a new roadside unit service for that that somebody has to develop, and actually we would require a high coverage of roadside units that we don't have nowadays. So there's a huge cost factor to that, and actually in this research that's not reflected. Nobody is actually calculating what would it cost to deploy a system like that just for misbehavior detection. So the question is, where do we go from there? Next one is pseudonym linkability. So if you get all those pseudonym certs from those cars at the traffic light, same situation, right? Uh, intelligent traffic light, uh, you're trying to decide if you change the uh, green face for a certain direction. If you could just take all the pseudonym certs and get to know which ones belong to a single car and which ones belong to different cars, you would be able again to figure out if there's a civil attack going on. But this would break the privacy point. Um, if, you, if there's a single entity in this um, whole system, and actually this would be a whole bunch of points, all the traffic lights that implement this intelligent traffic light application, if they would be able to break the pseudonymity in order to figure out which pseudonym sorts belong to the same car, then an attacker just needs to break into an RSU and get this capability and then could start tracking vehicles with that. That's one point. The other point is again that right now we haven't really figured out how you could do this quickly because it doesn't help you if you get this information like 30 minutes later. Not to speak about days where the system is currently with this capability. So you would need to get this kind of immediately. And nobody actually calculated so far how much traffic we would see with that, what the performance requirements are for that, and how we would implement that. So again, there is some, something to this idea, but nobody took it any step further so far. Then a couple more radio signal based. You could kind of do triangulation. Um, you could um, look into power differences. Um, Again, nobody really took this any further so far. Um, there are other schemes that are building on the um, swarm type of um, this kind of network itself, um, where you kind of vote if a situation that somebody is reporting on the V2X network right now is actually happening. So if there are a couple of devices that are having other capabilities like radar to verify if there's an obstacle or if there's actually somebody breaking, you could kind of vote on that and then let everybody know, okay, you can trust this message or you can't. Again, there's something to this idea, but we need a new protocol for that. Um, there is, again, an issue with pseudonym sh uh, cert change. What if the attacker just changed the pseudonym cert in between? So you need to do this again and again and again with each change. And the question is, what is the effect on automotive hardware for that? How much more computational power do you need for that? How much more communication will you have on the restricted channels um, that, you are, that are available for V2X? Again, who's working on that? <coughs> Reputation-based um, is kind of similar if over time other devices figured out that the messages that you send are actually trustworthy, um, you get a kind of a higher reputation point um, or a score and could use that in order to inform newly added devices to the system that you are actually a trustworthy source. But then again, this could be used for an, as an identifier or actually you need to have an identifier to do this over time uh, because otherwise you wouldn't know where to add those um, numbers to or the score to. So this has, again, implications on the pseudonymity, on the privacy aspect of the system, and nobody really looked into this so far. Then there's another interesting approach, which um, I think was presented just recently, um, where you kind of do multi-source fusion within the car itself, the receiving end. Um, 
I think it's a logical step if you have radar, if you have lidar, if you have other sensors, and V2X is just another sensor. You could kind of fuse all of those information and see what the probabilities are that there actually is somebody breaking or that there actually is um, an obstacle uh, somewhere. Um, I think this is worthwhile looking into, but again, the question is what are the requirements on the automotive side for that? And maybe I have to highlight this for people that are not working on the OEM side on the automotive industry, but um, computational power is restricted, um, energy levels are restricted, memory is restricted because we're trying to do things cheaply. And we are re having re uh, special requirements on hardware because we need to accommodate way higher temperature ranges than um, consumer hardware does. Um, so there are a couple of special specialties to automotive hardware um, that you need to keep in mind when you design a system like that, that OEMs are sometimes fighting about cents. A couple of cents added to a car, and you look at one of the big car companies, five million cars per year, um, a cent might make a difference there. So all of this is research. The question is, where are we with actually implementations? Um, do we have anything implemented and tested out and have the data to see if this actually works performance-wise in terms of detecting quickly misbehavior, but also in terms of automotive restrictions? And the only thing that I know of so far is actually work done by Kemp and by the USDOT. Um, and I just want to dip into this a little bit um, in the next couple of slides. Um, they have a concept where they differentiate between local misbehavior detection and global misbehavior detection. Local misbehavior detection is the process that identifies locally in a device misbehavior or at least creates a suspicion that there is something wrong and then collects data. It's like a monitor in classical IT security speech. Some some data point, some node in the network that kind of reports back to you whenever there's anything kind of fishy. And then the global side is the backend that collects all of this data, all of those reports, and then tries to figure out if there was actually something going on. Because on the device level, you might not be able to actually make a hard binary decision. Yes, this was misbehavior, or no, this wasn't. Um, so there's the idea here is that you have a backend which collects from a whole bunch of devices those reports and then somehow or hopefully makes a decision call that or a call to identify that this was misbehavior or not. How does this work? The two, I, th two, I think, two methods that were implemented so far on actual devices um, are proximity plausibility. So if you see a couple of cars driving around and their messages they might start overlapping because of bad GPS reception or because there is an attack going on. And if this happens a couple of times, then you on the receiving end start being suspicious and saying, oh, there's something going on, so I better file a report, collect all those messages that I got um, that looked like they were overlapping, sign them and send them off to the global site. Another one is false warnings. So I got messages that caused me to f uh, issue a warning to my driver, for example, for a forward collision warning. Like there is a car braking right in front of you and therefore you should engage your brakes. So I already made this decision in my device that there's something going on. I warn my driver or I engage the brakes if I have an autonomous car in this way. Um, but then nothing happens especially when I just put it out to the driver, there's no driver reaction. He's not engaging the brakes, he's not steering away, and there wasn't a crash. So something with this data was wrong. I got clearly data that there's somebody in my lane braking pretty hard, and I'm only that far away, so there has had to be a driver reaction to that, but there wasn't. So again, I collect this data and send it off to the global site. This kind of process is called misbehavior reporting, collecting the evidence and then sending it off um, to the global site. The only two algorithms that are implemented so far and um, some got some form of testing are device-based and event-based. Device-based is a pure counter. 
how often do I see the same pseudonym cert sending messages that led to the receiving end to actually create a misbehavior report? It's just a counter. Whenever I see the same pseudonym cert, I count up, and when, when there's a threshold reach, like five times, for example, I decide, okay, this device is misbehaving, so I just put it on the CRL or it put its um, certificates on the CRL and let everybody know to not trust this device anymore. The other one is a little bit more sophisticated. Um, this one is location specific, so I have a predefined area. Um, I put all the, pseudonym, uh, the, the misbehavior reports um, that are coming from this area together. I look under the pseudonym certs, and actually I use the capabilities that are built into the system, and here I'm referencing again to my talk before, or to um, Craig's book, um, how this actually works, but there is some way that the misbehavior authority within the system is able to check if those reports are actually about the same device or about different devices. It doesn't get the pseudonym certs for that, so it can't start tracking, it just gets this binary information, they belong together or they didn't. And if they belong together to the same device, um, and again, if there's a threshold reached, the, the misbehavior detection authority um, puts the device or its certificates on the CRL. And this is the last step, um, which is called device revocation, or sometimes blacklisting, because in Europe we don't do revocation, we just blacklist the device so it doesn't get new certificates. But there's some, some form of penalty to the device in order to exclude it from the network. So how does this work? Um, an example. We have a misconfigured device or an actual attacker, doesn't matter in this case. Um, there are three cars, A, C, and D, that are just regular V2X equipped cars and a suspicious device B. And B's position is slightly off. Could be programming error, could be that we are in New York City, downtown, and we get bad GPS reception, or it could be that there's actually an attacker um, spoofing the GPS inputs to this car. And therefore, the device or the messages of this device look like that there is a B slash car in my lane, or in the lane of A, C, and D. This is this kind of ghost car on the bottom right. So we go further and then we see a first overlap. Um, all the cars are recognizing this and seeing, okay, those messages overlap and therefore those cars had to overlap. And they're starting collecting the evidence. They see one overlap, another overlap, and a third overlap. And in this example, the threshold is three for the local misbehavior detection. So after three overlaps, I decide, okay, this looks suspicious, so I send off a report. And as this happened pretty quickly, the chances that the sending device was changing its pseudonym certs is pretty low. So it looks like three times overlap with the same pseudonym cert. If the global misbehavior detection looks at those reports, it can decide B is misbehaving and therefore it should be revoked. How could you trick this? And again, this is conceptual level already. Um, we didn't do a proof of concept for that. Um, but on the conceptual level already, you could say, I have three cars hacked. The chances are, if you're capable of hacking one of the cars, that you can hack the same model, model same model year, same brand, um, and a different car are pretty high because of the reuse uh, in the automotive industry. So let's assume they were able, as an attacker, to gain access to the private keys of three different cars, same model type, and, and so on. Those cars are labeled here A, B, and C. And what you do now is you pick a victim, which is V in this case, the yellow car. Attackers are red. And you create a couple of fake cars, A1, B1, and C1 with your messages. So you're sending messages that look like you were in this lane, we're actually not in this lane, you're just one lane to the left in this case. Um, if you send out those messages over the V2X network, everybody will see them. And the other cars, the green cars around there will noticing 
those overlaps of your cars with the victim. As you've hacked this system, um, or the, the cars, you can exchange pseudonym certs for those cars. We have either 20 or 100 in Europe. Uh, so could, you could use for each message that shows an overlap a different pseudonym cert. Um, but you actually don't need to because once you overlap three times with it, it looks like V is always overlapping, whereas the others are not. They're just overlapping with V. So with the currently implemented methods on the global side, the misbehavior authority would actually revoke the victim's car. As an attacker, you would have reached your goal in kind of getting this car out of the system because now it can't use, or nobody's trusting their messages anymore, and therefore in crash situations, for example, nobody will actually believe that the car is where it is reporting it, that it is. Um, so, what do we do? And that's a big question mark, because if you look at ongoing work right now, um, what different stakeholders are doing um, nowadays, I only found so far two stakeholders doing anything. First of all, the USDOT, um, they took the work of, um, that they created together with CAMP, and decided that the connected vehicle pilots that are being deployed here in the US right now, in New York City, in Wyoming, and in Tampa, should implement some form of minimum viable misbehavior product in their devices. So the capability of doing local misbehavior detection in some form should be implemented so that we get a little bit of a larger scale test out in the real world. Which is good. Um, and the other one is a sensor-based approach to misbehavior detection. This is kind of the step where we go and start doing sensor fusion. We take LiDAR and radar information and add V2X information on top and see if there are anything, any devices that report a position which doesn't reflect physical reality. And if so, report again back up there. I think those are necessary steps. Um, and I can only appreciate the work that the USDOT is doing there. Um, but what else do we see right now? In France, there's a project called Secure Cooperative Autonomous Systems, and they're actually looking into viable misbehavior detection approaches right now, and the idea is they implement the full chain. They're following the same approach, local and global misbehavior detection, um, creating reports, and then finally revoking or blacklisting. But that's it. And the question is, if you look into the news as of lately, there are industry is deploying um, the systems. We have OEMs that are uh, putting this um, into their cars. We have roadside operators that are putting devices out there. Um, so this is happening right now. But it looks like nobody is really solving this issue that whenever there was somebody able to get around the first line of defense, what happens next? So this is a big concern of mine. I don't know if you share this concern. The question that I'm asking myself and trying to ask you is, why is that? Why is nobody taking this seriously enough? If you look at the applications, and I just showed five out of, I think, 50 or 70 applications that are defined by now for V2X, I think this is critical infrastructure. And for critical infrastructure, we need to look onto the additional lines of defense beyond the first line, especially with systems like that that will operate for 30, 40, 50 years into the future. We have to anticipate that at some point somebody is able to get around this. So what do we do? Why is it that nobody actually takes this seriously? So any ideas in the audience? Nope. I have, I have a couple of stomach feelings here. So this is kind of a hypothesis that I want to try out here. Maybe there is some misconception about the status of V2X security. Maybe especially in the higher up ranks, um, people think that, oh, we, are, we have it covered. We're already working on this. We're already spending so much money on, on secure hardware and um, figuring things out for protecting the private keys. So that's enough. That's all we can do. Is that the case? 
Or is it just that somebody did a risk analysis and said, yeah, we don't have that many cars yet on the road and that many roadside units yet on the road. So this is an issue which we need to handle and figure out down the road somewhere. Could be. What adds to this is in the last two years, I oftentimes saw a couple of papers published uh, in the car hacking area um, where respectful researchers and heads off to them were able to get, for example, into an infotainment system. And when you read their papers and you're pretty excited about it, especially when you work in automotive, you see, hey, there was somebody able to go around my first line of defense. So what did they do with that? And then in the end, they kind of claim we would have been easily been able to control the car by that. And then nothing. And I oftentimes think, okay, so you kind of made me excited about your research. Um, I read the news because the media might get just this last line saying, oh, they were able to kind of remote steer the car or brake or whatever. And then it's just, we might have been able or we were being able, but no proof of concept. From a researcher's point of view, I think, yeah, I don't know. And the feedback that I oftentimes get from the industry is then, yeah, you know, those researchers, they were able to get in there, but we have it covered. So there, there were no chance that they would get ever to the steering wheels or the brakes because we have separated cans and whatnot out there. So this is just for highlighting their research in the press. And I don't know. Maybe we need to get to the point where research takes this additional step. And I know it's hard work. I know it can be costly. I know it takes time. I know it doesn't make immediate news, especially if you are not able to create a proof of concept. But maybe we should go there and say proof of concept or a GTFO. Would that help? Because I think on the researcher area and in the security experts area, we all kind of have more or less knowledge on what they will be able to do. But just one or two steps up the chain, it's, oh, no, we don't need to work on anything there because we have it covered. They weren't able. There was no proof of concept. Nobody demonstrated that. They're just claiming. So they don't do anything. They don't get the budgets in place. They don't get the time in place, the people in place to work on that stuff. Maybe this adds to that. I don't know. Any other ideas? Yep. Why there is so much emphasis on the anonymity here when my phone, which has maybe a MAC address or even I don't know the messages in April 2011, does it have a MAC address or some kind of RF fingerprint that I could use instead of a certificate to identify yeah. and track a vehicle? Why is so much emphasis on this issue? Because I've been reviewing a lot of papers on. So the, yeah. so the question was, why do we emphasize privacy so much? Or actually, we have two questions. So much because everybody's carrying around a cell phone already, and locations get sent wherever. And on the other hand, isn't there anything else in the stack that you could use as a fingerprint and therefore ID to track devices? The last question, my answer to this is, the idea is there's none of this in there. So MAC addresses get changed. Every, all, all of the IDs get changed, and actually there's already work, and I think there are chips available, radio chips, that make it hard, if not impossible, to do a RF fingerprinting to use that as an identifier. Why do we do this? Already has that, yeah. Right. Because first of all, we were expecting a regulation, and there are laws in place, as I do understand the market over here, that they have to protect privacy, or at least give the option for that. And second, I think the OEM industry has to cater not only like the general public, but also critical security and privacy concerned um, 
uh, citizens. So there is an interest in the industry to protect your privacy, especially because we are broadcasting this information. So it's not just Google or some app operator that collects your location information, and maybe you have even a chance to kind of configure your device in a way that it doesn't send those location information. No, we are broadcasting this. Everybody can collect those information. You just need to set up a passive listening device somewhere, and nobody actually would know that you're tracking. So everybody could do this, and that's the idea why we need to protect it, because you don't want to have your spouse looking for where you're going, or um, maybe you are a higher level target um, that needs to be protected. Um, so we want to protect as best as we can the privacy of our customers. Yeah. If you turn off V2V, especially, you lose all the safety applications, and that might be something that you don't want to. Okay, so where do we go from here? We certainly don't want to go back to those times, I hope. Um, so just rip all the online connectivity out of the cars because it doesn't work. Um, maybe for the last point I made about the proof of concept. Maybe we in the industry should critically comment on publications that are coming out, making statements about the probability that this actually works, um, how good the research was. Maybe this helps in order to get a public image on the work that is going on and a more realistic view in our organizations higher up. Maybe we have to kind of get in touch with the VTX application developers because they're way more than the security folks. Um, and tell them you have to define for each of your application what misbehavior is and where it could lead to and how you can detect it within your application. Because right now it's a very small group of security experts doing this and as I said there are 70, 80, whatever applications out there. There's no way that we can and ever catch up. So we need to get applications developers to get at least a basic understanding of what the security issues are and what they could add to prevent that. Have a conversation within your company about V2X and raise the issue and tell them um, what the issues are and that we need to work on that. There's another idea. Would it be useful to have a uh, V2X CTF? Yeah, that would be pretty awesome. I think uh, the Car Hacking act uh, Village actually um, discussed this uh, two years ago to add a V2X um, module to their batch in order to start working on this. Unfortunately, never managed to do it, or I don't know what the issues were, but there were only discussions so far. But maybe that's actually a good idea. Maybe we should have V2X CTF challenges next year in the Karkin Village. Anything else? Uh, yeah? That's a pretty hard problem. I don't have an answer right now on this, and that's actually my point. We don't have the answers yet. We need more research, or we need more um, kind of industry-led, applicable, large-scale testing of what research already did in order to figure out if this works. Because there are already all kinds of good ideas out there. The selected research approaches that I show today is just a small subset of the ideas that are out there but nobody took them further and actually tested them out to see how do they perform in terms of how quickly and uh, how often do they actually identify real misbehavior with the all, all the environment conditions that we have in automotive. Um, how much does it cost? That's always an, a question. If it's too costly, nobody will implement it. Um, so all those, there, there are tons of good ideas. My point is we need to work on that in order to get them implemented. Yeah? Yeah. 
Yeah. So there's an application. If 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 you are in a distress situation, it's called. You don't change your pseudonym certs. Okay, a couple of sources um, for this. There, I don't know how much time I still have, um, but as long as nobody kicks me out today, I'm happy to take more questions. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty good idea. So, um, what is implemented so far in the US is that there is a CL server which provides it, and the car or the devices, it's in their responsibility to connect on a regular basis to get them. Um, with DSRC, there's an issue because you don't necessarily can anticipate that they have cellular based on that. So, you need to have other approaches like roadside unit that provide connection to the CL server. Or there was another research um, approach where you have collaborative sharing of this information. So cars that already have a, f a refreshed CIL could share it with other cars that don't have it. Um, but it w this, as far as I know, was never really implemented. There might be some simulation work going on right now on this. Um, but this is an issue. When you look at CV2X, um, the new technology which is different from this Wi-Fi uh, DSRC standard, you already have a cellular modem in there. So the um, assumption is that you have way more regular connectivity to some backend and therefore could download this information. There is some margin of error which is built into the applications. Um, actually, you are not supposed to send your, you're not supposed to send BSM messages if you're out of a certain threshold, which is, I think, 1.4 meters or something like that. But there's some threshold built into that. But it's it depends on the device being able to tell that it's out of accuracy for for GPS. So if you spoof, there's a hard chance that the device is not able to tell. Especially if it doesn't have additional measures um, like deck reckoning um, for its positioning, um, and then it wouldn't know and still would send these messages. And in terms of overlap, again, this is the reason why we don't send immediately any overlap that we see on a local basis, but we wait until we saw like three overlaps or five overlaps. Nobody figured out the real threshold for this yet. Again, large-scale deployments missing this so far in order to test this out. But the idea is you don't report immediately each and every overlap because there could be some weird GPS condition going on right now. Has anybody done any research on um, one vehicle crossing across from one certification of party to another, like crossing an international border? <laughs> <laughs> So those are the hard, tough questions for the overall system. Uh, I can only answer them as good as I can because that's not necessarily security. It's more governance and politics and whatsoever. Um, I my, my personal view is we will see many CAs that are operated by the OEMs, for example. And they are independent of the country that the vehicle is operated in. They might be still restricted to a certain market, like there's a very small chance that a car that is produced for the North American market, which is Canada, USA, and Mexico at least, um, gets ever shipped to Europe or China and operated there. So there could be different CAs for a North American region, for a European region. Um, but there are also discussions there that, for example, the USDOT stands up, puts up a CA for that. And then the Canadian government has to do one, and the Mexican has to do one. So there are a couple of different concepts out there. The point is, as long as we don't have a regulation, we don't know, and it's up for industry to figure out and, and decide on that. Yeah. That's especially a question of, of latency, I, I think. Um, 
I think that the the overlap um, that we might see is an indication that like you create a suspicion locally that there is something going on because especially on the receiving end for overlap you don't know which one is wrong right you get two messages they are from different cars and they seem to overlap you don't know if car A or car B is wrong this is the reason why those this data is then sent off to a global misbehavior detection backend and the global backend will collect a couple of reports and if the same device shows up in different reports over and over again then there is a high probability that this device is somehow misbehaving whatever that means but in between between the first detected overlap and the decision of on the backend side to actually revoke this device and then getting the information out to all the other cars that this device is now revoked there could be actually crashes happening yeah Does anybody know if I'm running out of time? No? Okay. <laughs> yeah? So that's, um, that's another good example or a good question for an example. Um, if you have multiple local misbehavior detection approaches implemented, overlap and warning based, then you have a higher probability to make a local decision which one not to trust. But again, especially with the warning based, it might be too late for the driver because when you figured out, oh, there wasn't a crash, then there's a suspicion that there was somebody doing it wrongly but in case there is a crash, it's too late. <laughs> you know everybody was right or the messages were right, but it doesn't help you anymore. Okay, I get a signal that we are over. So if you like to continue the conversation, just hit me up after the talk, talk to my wife, um, or just send me a, a message on Twitter. Thanks. <laughs>